Everyone, if you can, please be seated, and those in the back, please move forward. Text any questions you would like to direct to the panel to the address shown on the screens. And as a courtesy to our panel members, we also ask that you silence all communication devices at this time. Welcome to the J2 panel for this year's event titled Chinese Communist Party on the March, Understanding and Dealing with China's Rise. The moderator for today is Rear Admiral Michael Stenman, J2 Director at US Indo-PACOM. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? I haven't earned that yet, uh, so we'll, we'll judge in an hour and a half, okay? So I hope you're charged up with some coffee. We're going to be truth tellers today. Uh, we're going to give you kind of the, the view uh, from an intelligence team where our jobs are to call a spade a spade. And so you're going to get some hard truths about China today, right? Um, looking forward to some uh, questions, but I think uh, for today what our plan is, if you'll allow us, uh, I'll speak just openly for a few minutes about uh, strategic context, uh, knowing we have a pretty educated audience here. And then uh, I want to show you some slides just to give you some visualization of uh, how we perceive Chinese influence and how we interpret what we're seeing. Uh, and then we'll transition after I'm done with running through those slides uh, to about five minutes for each of the uh, component uh, twos uh, that are here uh, so they can describe in their domains how they see uh, Chinese advances and what uh, disturbs or concerns them uh, the most about what they see. And then the remainder of time, hopefully, uh, at least the back third, if not a little more, will be for you to ask your toughest questions uh, to this panel, and we'll do our best to address them. Sound like a good plan? OK. Um, so uh, I, would, I think I, I'll start with uh, uh, confronting the brutal facts of our existence, and that is the strategic context here. Uh, I will tell you, in the 90s, when I first started looking at China, I had hoped, like the rest of uh, the national security community, that uh, China's rise was going to be a story of progress, uh, where we would see a China that moved to a more open society, that it would adhere to market principles, rule of law, that the rise of the middle class would form a more representative government as they became uh, more invested in the system, and that the growth of the military uh, would be one characterized by China as a responsible actor willing to support uh, peace, uh, stability, and prosperity uh, of the international order. Unfortunately, that's not what we have today, and it's unlikely to be anything that you'll see in your lifetimes. And so this is the challenge that we face. And unfortunately, it has many aspects of the Cold War, despite a reluctance by anybody uh, to call it uh, something of that nature. So let's be clear, let's start with the China dream, the rejuvenation. Uh, by 2049, at the latest, they expect to be the strongest power on the planet. They expect to have the commanding heights of the global economy, from which all other things, if you have a strong economy, flow in terms of the power of your instruments of government. And that they expect to be in a place which uh, they think is their historical right, which is the Middle Kingdom, with a set of vassal states, uh, clients, uh, that uh, will advance their objectives. So what is this, uh, what is this glimpse of China that's more powerful look like? And I think we've seen uh, what they do when they are strong, and that's uh, what we're going to talk about here. So if you look domestically, whether it's Tibet or Xinjiang or Inner Mongolia, you know, 40 percent of China is not Han Chinese. Um, uh, you can see how, in fact, uh, that government chooses to rule its people. And the problem is uh, that, you know, a government that stifles freedom and institutionalizes tyranny at home is one that has a particular tactic uh, which uh, that they then can project outward. And so that's happening here with this Orwellian approach to governance and how we see it manifesting across uh, the globe. China's a police state. It's totalitarian in nature where individuals, sectors of society, all support the state, and in this case, the Chinese Communist Party, right? And so this model that they're trying to export uh, to others is one 
where essentially they'll sell authoritarianism as effective, efficient, agile. Uh, and they compare it obviously to democracies which are slow and plotting and messy. And they say this is the best system for the future, right? And so this battle of the narratives over the, this concept of governance and the way the world should organize itself is fundamentally uh, where the friction points will be. Now, of course, in the Chinese system, the Faustian bargain there is that you sacrifice your individual liberties, and your freedoms, your say in the future of your country, and you give it over to a small cabal of you know, uh, leaders uh, that, uh, that have the best view of what's, uh, what's, what's best for the country. And so that's kind of where we are with the strategic context. And why do we worry about this? Because we now know the nature of China's rise. It was a matter of debate in foreign affairs and lots of other conferences for years and years. We now know the answer to what this rise looks like. We have the answer to uh, what China will do when they feel that they're powerful. And the answer isn't, uh, isn't, a, isn't uh, a good one. We've seen that China uses ill-gotten ways to advance the, their rise, lying, cheating, and stealing. It's very Machiavellian. Uh, the end justifies the means. Um, and we could cite thousands of examples, uh, whether it's the IP theft, which continues unabated, which Keith Alexander, when he was general of the NSA, called the greatest transfer of wealth in history. It is the adherence to the World Trade Organization standards. It is promises unfulfilled, uh, sweet talk, charm, uh, that ends up actually uh, biting in the end. And so, uh, so we have to deal with a China that's a talk and take government, uh, one that engages in political warfare, not domestically, but internationally, the propaganda, the disinformation, the deception, the gray zone activities, uh, just like Russia in many ways here. And so grappling with the nature of how to deal with political warfare uh, with a strong government that has instruments at its disposal to quickly be able to uh, get its voice on the world stage. Um, we, we bundle all these things together and we call it malign activity. Uh, so that's the short form that you'll hear from many government uh, uh, representatives. We also describe uh, Chinese behavior is pernicious, and that's a big SAT word. And you go into it, so what does pernicious activity mean? Uh, and we see, uh, as we look around, uh, that the Chinese black hand uh, starts with the commercial and the economic ventures and eventually bleeds over into the security areas. And so it does matter that China views itself where there is military civil uh, fusion in which everything actually comes back to the subject for decisions within the CCP. And so monitoring economic development and their advances in other places of the world becomes a very important thing, and one in which the intelligence community needs to get a little better at in terms of fine-grained analysis of where uh, the Chinese are maneuvering and what it means for us, our friends, our partners out there. So pernicious, let's go back to that word, you know, uh, the the choices countries are making around the world are generally short term, right? You get an influx of Chinese capital that enables you to have quick uh, victories if you're a politician because you show that there's advances in the de development of a state. Uh, and so you have an injection of things that look on their face as uh, benign and helpful. Uh, the challenge is that um, once the Chinese get their foot in the door, right, then the exploitation becomes uh, rampant, and it's like a hungry predator that you know, once you've given them access to your house, you know, is roaming around uh, at all times of the day and night, um, and in fact doing what it wants. And that's what we see in almost every state that's actually exposed itself uh, to Chinese leverage. And so you have the debt issues, the debt unsustainability there, the costs are all backloaded. In the beginning stages, you have a deal you can't resist, but all of the costs are down, down the pipe. And the corruption that comes in, the unfair, the unethical business practice, which are just a part and parcel of what the Chinese do, the opening up of illicit and illegal activity, you give the Chinese access, the organized crime quickly follows, right? Uh, the Chinese labor is used for projects, uh, right? Uh, they're, they're unfair labor 
uh, practices that Chinese use. They don't care about the environment very much. The, the, the construction and other things they do actually is pretty shoddy in places, and so that creates its own problem stream. And then what you find is that this economic uh, access is then used to leverage so that the security elements can come in behind, and then you have a creeping sort of level of influence with security, police, uh, and military, with much of the infrastructure that they have a stake in uh, having dual use potential, including uh, giving access to uh, the PLA now and into the future, as well as denying access by other nations, including the United States. Uh, the natural resource issue is a significant one, the local instability that's caused by much of China's behavior, and this marginalization of the people that occurs because uh, the Chinese essentially focus their uh, influence and corruption and bribery onto the business and political elites, the key influencers in a certain society that can facilitate for them the secret deals that gives them the access to uh, then give them the leverage that they need, which ultimately uh, allows them to actually coerce uh, after they've been able to co-opt. And so this is the nature of what, uh, what we are seeing today in China's approach. It's very effective, uh, and you find that our responsibility is to be truth tellers in this world and to inform our allies and our partners so that they can make the best decisions for their own sovereignty, uh, their own uh, stability, and to make wise choices when it comes to uh, economic contracts and development. And so that's where uh, I think we'll talk about counters a little bit later on, but I would offer that up as a strategic context. If you don't mind, I'm gonna drive right into a few slides to help you kind of see a little bit of what I'm talking about, all right? So Bobby, if you can throw this up. So the military perspective, go back one, please. So when we talk about increasing hard power here, there's lots of troubling things uh, here when uh, China is able to, in fact, uh, create instruments uh, that are very, very powerful and coercive. And we see that it's not just the equipment out there, it's the joint training, it's the reorganizations that have enabled them to be a more modern power. A lot of people talk about, well, they're combat inexperienced. Uh, well, they're not joint qualified. Well, we're not sure about the, the system's capabilities. They can't bring it together. And in every case, I could give you example upon example of where the Chinese have actually been doing more training than we do, more f live fire uh, shots of missiles. These aren't just R&D. They do the most in the world, by the way. Two-thirds of them are in practice and in training, right? They, they allow for realistic training in ways that would boggle your mind, right? Missiles coming very close to ships in their training as they do live fires. The use of electronic warfare, cyber, all integrated in more complex exercises than ever before. Things that last multiple months that have Taiwan invasion or North Korea scenarios or counter U.S. intervention. They've been working on this for a long, long time, and they have built up a very powerful force, and it has specific purposes in mind. And it's not simply the local wars issue. This is about the global power that they want to build to reinforce their global interests, and as history has proven, flag always follows trade, right? And so you're going to see a more expansionist China on your doorstep no matter where you are and what continent you're on. Okay, let's show the next uh, slide here. And this is just a, a review of history. Uh, if we looked at 1999, we would project for you here, these were the, the, the types of equipment that we would consider advanced at that time. It's not all the old legacy stuff, which was uh, Legion. What you see here uh, are the things that in 1999 we would consider uh, to be very advanced and comparable to many Western uh, assets. It's not exact. You have one fighter, for example, a symbol there that's worth 25 uh, fighters. But that's where we were at the end of the 20th century. Next slide. 20 years hence, we have that amount of capability. Notice the satellite capabilities, ISR, PNT, COM relay. Um, you have the modern fighters uh, there, bombers, special mission aircraft of all types, including ASW, EW, uh, command and control, carrier force, right? You've seen the second carrier, if you're paying attention, coming down to the Taiwan Strait and rehoming perhaps the Hainan Island here in the last few days. 
uh, and maybe a half a dozen that they may produce uh, in time, uh, but they're well on path and they're building them like hotcakes. Same with the surface force, same with the amphibious force, same with the submarine force, all equipped with very advanced long range uh, cruise missiles and other capabilities, including a cruiser that will have a ballistic missile capability with fairly long range. And then you take a look at the missiles that are advanced here, every sort, every category, SRBMs up to the ICBMs, including working on hypersonics. Uh, and, and so that's, uh, that's the current picture. And we're gonna just give you a quick look at trajectories for 2025. Next slide, please. And so here's how we see uh, the growth over time based on uh, what we know. You'll have to trust us on how we know, but that's kind of what we see right now. The Chinese are going to work on their fifth five-year, uh, five uh, sorry, their, another five-year plan for FY21 and 25. So we'll get back to you uh, after a time on whether or not this will hold true. But we see no indication that they're going to come off path to what, the they, what they've set out for their objectives in terms of each of these capabilities in every warfare area and in every domain. And we haven't even talked about cyber. Next slide. What I want to do is essentially give you a map of the Earth and just overlay how we see Chinese influence growing. Everyone, I think, here is aware of their basing in Djibouti, you know, the place where they uh, treat as their own sovereign ground. This is sort of a pattern of behavior. We've seen this in Argentina, too, uh, with their satellite tracking station. Once they get a, a piece of Earth, they act like that's sovereign territory. That's what's happening in Djibouti. Uh, and a lot of friction there with local U.S. Uh, capabilities, lazing of our pilots, uh, other forms of harassment. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the Chinese, uh, you know, established overseas base today. Uh, so that's one hub. Next slide. And so these are uh, significant port investments uh, by the PRC and their state-owned enterprises. Uh, these are major port enterprises. I could give you many more dots for other investments in other ports, but these are the major ones. So this gives you a sense of not just the sort of the economic interests, but also where uh, future military operations uh, may be conducted, because many of these ports will have dual-use uh, capabilities. Next. We've uh, overlaid on here uh, evidence of Chinese interest in basing. And so you can see these yellow dots uh, here, the start of how they expand in to, in, inside, outside core. Uh, where you see interest in Oceania, you see Eastern and Southeast Asia. Uh, we used to call this the string of pearls. Uh, that, that string of pearls is lengthened and will continue to lengthen as they establish areas where they can essentially have coaling stations to be able to enable them to advance their security interests should the economic interests be threatened uh, or to do other things to be able to influence the nature of uh, future among uh, global nations. Okay, those arrangements, uh, I'll follow next with a, a look here. Bobby, if you can go. So these are uh, countries that are supporting OBOR. Those who have signed up. Those are the small red triangles. And so you can see uh, that uh, access to infrastructure will only continue. I've listed ports, but there's also other forms of infrastructure in the energy areas, airfields, et cetera. Next slide. So uh, countries working on Huawei, 5G, 60 have signed up uh, so far, eight in the last uh, year here. And of course, the Chinese uh, IT companies have penetrated almost every nation's markets uh, over the last uh, few years. What that does is it increases the surface area for Chinese uh, to be able to have a global platform for uh, propaganda, for censorship, and for uh, essentially espionage that enables them to have further advantages in influencing the societies that they, they live in. Next. And so here are the Confucius Institutes, about 550 of those uh, worldwide. What are those? Those are soft power mechanisms. Those are ones that are designed to show a rosy side of Chinese history, designed to reduce fears of China's strength, to portray a China that has always been peaceful. Uh, these are areas where the, the Chinese can actually spot and assess send you do human kinds of things to look for key influencers, whether you're young or you're old. Uh, these, uh, these Confucius Institutes are, uh, are essentially a soft power tool of political warfare. Uh, some countries have gotten more wise to what they're up to. Uh, the U.S. still has many. Uh, here we've reduced some on U.S. campuses, 
uh, but they still remain. The Chinese will continue to use this tool as a way uh, to reduce fears about uh, China's intentions. Next. And so uh, it's worth taking a look at uh, what a China does when they operate around the planet. Uh, these are just a few representative areas. Uh, these charts actually show the last couple of years only. Uh, it's not a compilation of history over time, so there'd be more yellow areas. But this is where the Chinese fleets go with their motherships, uh, where they look for port access you know, as they try to extract uh, resources to, to fuel China's rise, exploiting uh, exclusive economic zones almost everywhere they go. And then you can also see on here the research ships and survey locations. Why are they in those places? Well, part of it's uh, obviously uh, marine research, uh, but most of it actually is about resource exploitation and how they want to use the seabed to be able to get rare earth minerals, the manganese nodules, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also, uh, these are long lead uh, activities that give us a sense of where the PLA military will ultimately operate uh, with their ships and their submarines. And you'll notice the polar interest uh, there for both the economic, but also for security interest to be able, for, for example, in the Antarctic to track our satellite systems to be able to provide more fulsome coverage of the ephemeris of our satellites with an aim to be able to destroy them in wartime. Next. And so we show uh, just the last uh, year or two here with <clears throat> PLA activities in the red dashes to give you a sense that it's not just home waters, near seas. Uh, this stuff that we're seeing is expanding uh, every month. Uh, the Chinese, as you may know, they go out routinely uh, to Djibouti with uh, surface action groups, all designed to give them familiarity and training with operations for extended periods and to get familiar with the areas where they think they may have to protect their sea lines of communication. All right, and so I think that's the last one. I think I have a, a compilation as a PLA, or sorry, a Chinese uh, a total map there. Um, one more piece here on diplomatic uh, flips that China has been able to affect uh, through the leverage that they have in certain countries, the promises of economic uh, uh, help and so you, you know that Solomon Islands and Kiribati were the latest two uh, to flip here in the Indo-Pacific, uh, all with an attempt to further isolate Taiwan and essentially have no one complain later on when they may want to have options to militarily take action to resolve uh, the long-standing sovereignty issue that they think is their premier one uh, there when it comes to Chinese uh, territory. Okay, so the next one was the total influence. Bobby, step through that, please. Okay, next. I'm almost done here. Um, two more slides. This is the one that we would offer up to you. Um, we somehow have a mangled bottom line on control. But this is, a, this is China's playbook for how to create a vassal state. You'll see a Secretary Mattis quote there. There's more than one way to lose your sovereignty in this world, not just bayonets. It could be countries bearing gifts and uh, large loans, piling massive debt, knowing that countries will not be able to repay it. I mean, the system is pretty clear. I mean, they assess in the first stage, right, to take a look at what you, no matter how big you are, uh, what you can add to China's rise. The grooming stage, uh, you know about uh, free trips to China with you and your family there, most of which doesn't have anything to do with uh, the profession of the uh, invited guest. Uh, designed to, uh, to charm. Uh, that leads uh, to a number of different incentives that come, much of it sort of that aims at personal profit for key influencers, right? And so this is where the promises, the kickbacks, and the bribery come into play. Then that wave of contracts comes with a consolidation and lock-in. Uh, once they have uh, been able to get these things um, signed, hopefully secretly and quickly, before there can be much uh, debate about those in uh, the larger society. Then it leads to the infrastructure projects. China likes to sweeten things up with more uh, positive optics where they'll build a soccer stadium, where they'll build a museum or something else that looks like the Chinese are benefactors. And what you end up in uh, very quickly is sort of this control feature where in fact many of the political elites end up in a situation where there's so much uh, PRC leverage over them that many of their choices, sovereign choices in terms of foreign policy 
are ones that are subject uh, to uh, Chinese influence in very significant ways. And so that's what's going on. Next slide, last slide. We would throw up other manifestations of China's rise. I'm going to leave this one up here as we continue to have uh, discussions, but uh, the phrase of making the world safe for authoritarianism is not an exaggeration. We think about the corruption, the technical means that the Chinese use in terms of safe city, smart city, access to data, big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning. This moves on. Take a look at uh, the impingement of freedoms. Hong Kong is an example. There would be no unrest if China had kept its promise to give Hong Kong high amounts of autonomy. They've been eroding it, and that's the reason why uh, Chinese students are making their last stand uh, there, and hopefully we can avoid another Tiananmen. Uh, the prosecution of minorities, the gulag systems, the re-education camps that you find, uh, that is the Chinese way. And then the world order. We've heard a lot about undermining the world order. Well, these are just examples of what we see the intimidation, the bullying in the South China Sea, the reclamation, the militarization of features, the ignoring UN tribunal uh, uh, rulings uh, here, overfishing, exploitation, destruction of the environment, um, power projection, predatory lending. It goes on and on all the way through, along with the political warfare. Uh, at the same time, uh, the Chinese are very purposeful about co-opting international institutions, whether they're IT standards or the, the UN. So they're flooding, essentially, the field with uh, people who can internally, within the international order, within the systems we help set up, uh, can be able to change the rule system to be able to advantage the Chinese and disadvantage us and others. So that's the sobering news that I'll provide to you. Um, I could enrich this with a lot more uh, detail if you want, but that's the nature of the challenge that we face. We're trying to be direct and honest about it because we think that sunshine is the des best disinfectant when it comes to dealing with the Chinese, and we have a lot more truth-telling to do in our respective jobs if we are able to allow people to understand the nature of the challenge and then do something about it. With that, I'm going to turn it over, and we're going, to, we're going to go back to sort of a military angle on this, and I'm going to allow the twos from the respective components to talk about what they see with regard to uh, military capabilities in each of their respective domains. So, Captain Butera, if you can launch off. Thanks. Sir, thank you. Good morning. I'm Captain Tony Butera. I'm the Director for Intelligence and Information Operations at U.S. Pacific Fleet. <clears throat> so, first, I'm going to express my gratitude to Admiral Mackey and AFSIA fellow twos, and uh, of course, Admiral Studeman. Uh, he's been focused on Asia for at least 25 years. In 1998, I read an article in the Naval War College Review as I was the JICPAC Northeast Asian Navy Branch Chief about the Spratly Islands by a Lieutenant Commander Select Studeman. His analysis proved to be a work of prophecy. You should check it out. I've been an acolyte ever since, so it's good to be back on watch with you, sir. It's a good thing to say in public uh, there as a component and two. Well done. <laughs> you earned some good points there. So now on to the truth-telling. <laughs> You're the man. Um, the Pacific Fleet is on watch to execute priorities uh, for Indo-PACOM in the maritime domain, domain, and we are focused on the PRC now more than ever. Xi Jinping once referred to the PRC as the awakened lion, a reference to the Napoleon Bonaparte quote, admonishing folks to stir the Asian nation. <clears throat> so this morning I wanted to drop anchor and cover three things about the malign lion, the rising PLA in the maritime domain. So here's the truth. First, the PLA isn't rising, it's risen. The title of this panel is Understanding and Dealing with China's Rise. The PLA Navy has risen. Its counterparts are probably catching up, and I might catch some flack from peers on that. But in the maritime domain, we are in the dealing with it phase. Secondly, I'm starting to wonder if the PLA's global expansionist tendencies that I'm a student briefed you on are a distraction from its essence, retaking Taiwan and shoring up its regional claims, as well as providing a counter-intervention force for both. Can it do both that global expansionist mission and its core regional missions effectively and efficiently? Lastly, the PLA investment in information warfare is something that our Navy and our Joint Force must deal with and perhaps learn from. Our carriers are at risk, but I will not call them vulnerable. That implies weakness. PRC, ISR, and T is a planning consideration, not a fait accompli. There's been a lot of press lately about that. So first, We'll talk about China's rise and the PLA's rise we could after 2015. Again, PLA versus PLA Navy. 
The PLA Navy has been the CCP's focus of program development, pressure, and praise for 23 years, ever since we parked two aircraft carriers off their coast in 1996. Now over 300 warships, it boasts itself as the world's largest Navy by hull count, also the world's largest Coast Guard, with over 225 cutters exceeding 500 tons. And they really have the world's only maritime militia with over 1,000 hulls under some sort of sovereign command. We reviewed briefly the portfolio of surface and subsurface anti-ship cruise missiles. It also transformed uh, regular ballistic missiles into anti-ship ballistic targeting capabilities with network sensors that can limit U.S. carrier employment. Couple this with more advanced surface-to-air missiles and jumps in radar and sensor technology based on some um, CDC breaches and the greatest theft, uh, as General Alexander mentioned. Um, we must respect the PLA Navy that's underway today. That PLA Navy is afloat and backed by cruise missiles ashore as well as H-6 bombers that Jake will talk about. While still limited in range and capability, these aircraft are operating the maritime domain with a new level of coordination, probably directed by the 2015 realignment of the PLA. The Navy is also in step with other modern navies, incorporating UAVs, undersea platforms, and hypersonic glide vehicles in various stages of research, testing, and development, some of which were proudly displayed during the 1 October Navy Day Parade, excuse me, National Day Parade. These will be a factor in naval combat, but PLA researchers are not outpacing the rest of the world in these areas, in my estimation. So let's take a minute after the naval capability part to consider where the PLA Navy is and where they, they aren't. The force buildup and maturation of the PLA Navy is really about Taiwan. It's required to have a counter-intervention force and an ability to stake and maintain regional sovereignty claims. The PLA Navy uh, excuse me, expansionist strategy seems like an additional duty at times and was built on the assumption that the CCP's expansionist claims would not be contested. Admiral Sudeman mentioned, uh, you know, a drop in piracy in the Central Command AOR and the, and the deployment of those ships still there, exercises and operations in the Arctic, fishing fleet uh, intimidation with Coast Guard escorts around the globe. But in general, the CCP's expansionist claims um, have been contested in certain domains and in, with certain partners. So I guess that, that expansionist calculus hasn't always worked out as they had envisioned. Yesterday, I believe Admiral Davidson reiterated our country's collective commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific. My boss, Admiral Aquilino, takes that guidance and tells me, Rocco, clear the path. The, the overwatch that our intelligence and information operations team provides ensures the fleet, our allies, and partners can safely sail, fly, and operate anywhere international law allows. The PLA Navy seeks to have ships, boats, and other um, craft guarding every station while others meet intruders in their claimed regions. And yet more holes are required, challenging every hydrocarbon prospecting ship in the South China Sea. <clears throat> this has to be fiscally ex exhausting and phys excuse me, physically exhausting and fiscally draining, if there's any budgeteers or program managers in the, in the crowd. The pressure of the PRC maritime forces is not decreasing, but we are meeting that pressure with our own. Brits, Australians, the French and Canadians and Indians have all challenged PRC expansion claims in various domains and areas. With every moment, the PLA shows itself and its capabilities through this expansionist and the regular operations that you saw in that graph that Admiral Sudeman presented, it demonstrates its interior lines. They are long and, and stretched to invoke Germany. The U.S. Navy is watching and learning with every deployment. I presume our partners are too. So my third point is probably the most impressive change that I have seen in the PLA since that 1999 time at JICPAC. So this is a te technical conference, so in this room, we have to acknowledge that the combined capabilities that analysts commonly refer to as the PRC's ISR&T, or counter ISR&T from a U.S. perspective, is an evolved programmatic approach to information warfare and information systems, as exemplified by the stand-up of the PLA Strategic Support Force. The PLA operates about 60 of the country's 120 space-based ISR systems, according to a recent DIA unclassified publication. Most of those could support monitoring, tracking, and targeting U.S. and allied forces through the Indo-Pacific region. Technological improvements in the ground-based fusion systems across the Joint Force also improve decision-making for a maritime or joint commander. So says DIA's unclassified China military power project. What seems logical, however, is that the more networked and centralized the PLA and its IRT ISRT becomes, the more vulnerable it is. 
Remember the plan in the PLA Rocket Force, partners specifically developed anti-ship ballistic missiles because the PLA Navy had no other counter to the power of the U.S. Navy and its aircraft carriers in 1996. It took them 23 years to develop it. These developments are, are a consideration in the Pacific Fleet force employment. Does that mean the C4ISR system is 10 feet tall? Maybe nine. Do I lose sleep at nights dissecting the challenges this system presents to the fleet? Yes, absolutely. Do we need to understand it better? Sure. Does that mean our carriers will be parked in the exact same spot they were in 1996 when we were directed to respond to a crisis? No, but as an adversary capabilities involved, so do our plans. My commander's priorities are C5 ISR and T and target quality, a target quality cop ready for networked high-end weapons. And I'm a targeting officer at heart. Show me an adversary system and with enough money, time, and manpower, the IW team at PAC Fleet, with some help from Indo-PACOM, the broader U.S. intelligence team, and industry partners will break it. A flag officer recently pressed me about investments in information warfare versus traditional programs of record. He said, the problem when you design and build a new FFG is you know what you're getting. You can quantify the return on investment in combatant capability and force generation. We have to master and break the PRC, ISR, and T system to give my commander and the Indo-PACOM commander the high confidence the carrier strike groups can turn the tide. I challenge this audience and the programmers, comptrollers, cores to deliver an IW capability with metrics that measure your work and convince that flag officers and others like him that the return on investment for IW programs is tangible and represents as much combat power as an FFG or dare I say a CVN in this high-end fight. So Xi Jinping is right. The lion is awake. I think the PL Navy has risen these guys will use a gerundive, I'm using past tense. From a maritime perspective, we need to deny their attempts to be a global presence and dominate the effort to deconstruct their ISR and T in support of our work plans. Thanks to FCA and thanks for your time. I'll stand by for questions at the end. All right, I guess I'm next. Uh, Admirals, thank you very much for uh, letting us uh, come up here and talk to you. So I'm Trent Fingerson, I'm the J2 for SOCPAC. SOCPAC's a theater special operations command, the one here in Hawaii. Um, there are several that uh, are stationed throughout the world. Uh, every GCC has a TSOC. Um, so my boss got on deck about 18 months ago, and uh, traditionally the Pacific uh, TSOC was very much focused on uh, counterviolent extremism, uh, primarily the Philippines, Indonesia, um, and watching those foreign fighters in the, in the CZ potentially coming back into the region. So when my boss got on deck about 18 months ago, reporting to Admiral Davison, said, boss, I want to be aligned with your priorities. 18 months ago, uh, SOCPAC changed its focus and is very much now today focused on counter PRC. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about mostly today. But we still do some other things. We still, we still are the executive agent for uh, CT and VO and, and crisis response. But we'll talk mainly about China today. So. Um, Tony talked about a free and open uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, that's our com big commander's guidance uh, to us all. Um, where SOCPAC plays into it is leveraging those special operations initiatives activities that are inherently soft and employing them throughout the Indo-Pacific AOR. Um, we have a, a network of folks that are operating in about 18 different countries in the AOR that are on a day-to-day -day basis uh, executing those activities. Uh, some are highly classified and some are very vanilla, you know, medical support, uh, um, helping out with uh, uh, just training, uh, what you would imagine uh, a foreign uh, force might help another foreign force with. Um, so uh, those other things that we do um, are in line with that, but that allows us access into those countries um, to promote the preferred partner, the, the better uh, choice, uh, as Admiral Sudman talked about with these malign activities that uh, the PRC is pushing out. If you look at that span from assessing to control, we present an option for those foreign partners to um, you know, latch on and, and work with us. Um, so illuminating one of those assets and how we do that, you know, so helping out those, those partners, um, we also like to illuminate uh, the PRC's malign activities. Um, my boss, being a, a you know, career special operator, um, wants to, you know, us to continue to press 
IO themes and, and engage primarily in IO warfare in this, in this environment that we are today. So we take our capabilities and with the help of industry are looking to pursue a way to continue to rapidly advance to the level that our uh, the le level that the PRC is able to message. So a big effort by Indopaycom J2 and the, and the collective is to help um, bring a lot of the activities that were briefed to you into the, this open environment to better educate you all on these activities because I think most of us, um, when we go back to wherever we came from, our relatives, our aunts and uncles might not necessarily be paying attention to what China's doing today. And I think extension, uh, existentially, that it's a quiet threat that most folks don't realize. Um, so uh, we're aligned with the NDS, we're aligned with Indopaycom's priorities. I, I also failed to mention we're aligned with SOCOM's priorities. So my boss has two bosses. Uh, he has the Indopaycom commander and he has his boss down in Tampa. And, and the SOCOM commander is that commander for all those TSOCs. Um, one thing that Admiral Suman mentioned that I wanted to highlight on is that playbook, that assess to control. That is really um, what my boss has charted me and my team to focus on, to illuminate those activities from finding out where the, a country who might be most vulnerable to getting access, to brokering deals, to uh, signing 99-year lease contracts, giving up that country's inherent sovereignty, and then bringing their, for their, their people in and then expanding that, that area and then effectively acquiring new terrain without firing one shot. So that's what we try to get after. Um, and then the last thing I'm gonna say is that um, our job is to help Indopaycom, SOCOM illuminate uh, these activities to help you all better understand what's going on and also do that skullduggery uh, that we did in the past to get after those hard targets uh, in the case we have to uh, leave this current uh, phase that we're in right now and uh, move on to a, a higher level warfare. Um, I don't have as long of a presentation that Tony did, uh, but uh, I hope uh, if you have some good questions after that, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Colonel Jake Holmgren, the PACAF A2. I work for General CQ Brown, who is the PACAF commander. And uh, kind of uh, building off my uh, compatriots, I, I would agree that uh, you know, from a, a PLAF perspective, uh, regionally, China has definitely arrived. They, they can dominate within the first island chain from their Air Force perspective. Uh, they are still rising, I think, when you get beyond that first island chain, but th they do pose uh, great concerns from an airman's perspective. And I'll go through about four uh, major areas of concern that, that we're really focused on and a couple of other thoughts, uh, you know, just kind of keeping it wave tops. Uh, number one probably is the, uh, as mentioned, is the H-6 uh, bomber, especially the H-6N, the uh, aerial refuelable version. Uh, that one definitely gives us concern because uh, right now with the H-6 and some of the, the cruise missiles and they're working on also air launched, uh, you know, ballistic missiles, those can actually, you know, deny us, you know, basing in the first island chain, the second island chain, and all the way out to Guam potentially. Uh, if you add on aerial refueling to that, now you really start threatening, you know, some of our allies and partners where uh, Japan is easier to access or they can get up there and uh, be in that airspace and presence. They could even get as far as Hawaii potentially or Alaska with that aerial refueling of the H-6. So clearly the Chinese are going in that direction where it's well beyond just a local power projection. You don't need that aerial, aerial refueling capability if you're just gonna stay uh, in your neighborhood and only threaten your neighborhood. So that, that's probably uh, one of the biggest concerns from the air components perspective. Uh, the second concern, from our perspective is the ballistic missiles, especially medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles. And it's essentially for the same reason, because you know, traditionally, uh, airmen, air power, we have these large bases that we base out of uh, in the Indo-Pacific and other areas. And uh, although that has a lot of strengths and synergies, that's also a weakness, uh, because those are very large, uh, very well-known targets. So you look at places like uh, Kadena and Okinawa, again, Anderson Air, ba air Force Base, in Guam, any other places that we might uh, put our bases with those intermediate and medium range ballistic missiles, uh, those are well within the capability of the, the, uh, the Chinese to target those. And especially with the uh, precision guidance, and as mentioned also, the hypersonic glide vehicles, that can really make the, the targeting prospect and the defense prospects uh, very, very challenging. 
from, uh, from that perspective and concerning for, for airmen. Uh, the third thing that I want to mention is uh, that's, uh, again, this is where they're rising. They haven't arrived yet, is uh, things like the J-20 and their stealth technology and really their, their capabilities in general. That is definitely a concern. We'll be watching them very closely as they, they develop their TTPs with their J-20, how they're going to use that platform. It kind of went from, you know, hey, is this thing really real? Is it just pie in the sky? To now it's something that we're definitely looking at very closely and concerned with. And again, that's all about trying to counter our capabilities and, uh, you know, reach out a little bit farther. And whether that's, uh, you know, air-to-air -air engagements or air-to-ground engagements, we definitely have concerns with their J-20 and their development of their, their more fifth-generation aircraft versus fourth-generation that they currently have. Uh, the fourth area that was alluded to that I'll kind of uh, end with before I go to a couple of other thoughts is really that kind of, uh, you know, the Chinese threat from an EW and cyber perspective. Uh, as mentioned, they are not sitting idle. They have a very, very respectable electronic warfare and cyber offensive capability, and I think that's probably the one as an airman that keeps me up at night and we're very concerned with. As far as that, you know, defensive capabilities on our side, being able to counter that, that's something we definitely need to be thinking strong about and, again, making sure that our, our capabilities operationally are, are well defended against the, uh, the Chinese, uh, you know, move forward in EW and cyber. Uh, a couple of other just quick thoughts uh, and concerns, I would say, you know, maybe not major, but on 23 July, a lot of you were probably tracking. The, uh, the Chinese came up with some H6s, met up with uh, Russian Tu-95s, did some things in the Sea of Japan, EC out there. And uh, that, that's concerning is, you know, what is the future of Chinese-Russian cooperation from an airman's perspective? Because again, that, that can pose multi-axis challenges. If, uh, even if it's kind of very light levels of cooperation, what can the, the Russians do potentially as a spoiler if the Chinese have something in mind in their sphere of influence? So uh, definitely keeping a close eye on that. And then I think uh, just ending with, the, you know, one of the things that we've definitely been looking at from uh, General Brown's perspective and PACAF to try to counter some of this, as a final thought, is, uh, is agile combat employment, the ACE concept, which really that's kind of a little bit of back to the future where we're looking at, you know, multiple bases in the Indo-Pacific for air forces and looking at ways that we can have smaller units potentially out on those smaller bases. And again, a lot of that is to, uh, you know, make things more difficult, make it a more challenging problem set for any potential adversary, uh, increase survivability, but really uh, just increase our unpredictability so that uh, we can face the future threat with eyes wide open. Thanks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Colonel Mike Marty. I'm the uh, U.S. Army Pacific Senior Intelligence Officer, or G2. So as a soldier and as U.S. Army Pacific, um, we're responsible for PLA ground uh, order of battle, so I'm going to focus on that this morning. As I frequently to motivate my analysts and uh, user pack G2, tell them, so from a basic terrain analysis at the strategic level standpoint, it looks like it's a maritime uh, theater. But what I often remind folks is that about 100% of the people live on land. Um, so it kind of keeps them, keeps them motivated on why we track ground order of battle. So in terms of uh, to frame what from a ground order of battle standpoint might be most concerning to me, here's what I'm not going to focus on. I'm not going to focus on how they're modernizing uh, their tanks or their armor, though they are and they're building large numbers of them. I'm not going to focus on their infantry fighting vehicles, um, though they are modernizing them, and they're building large numbers of them. Same for their long-range artillery. Same for their ground-based tactical uh, air defense systems. Same for their tactical communications. In fact, um, by type and numbers layering them in depth, which will increasingly make it harder for us to create a degraded command and control environment for them. I'm not going to focus on those. Uh, and it's not the biggest concern of ours because we're doing the same thing. And you will, as modern militaries do, you will get into a, a tit for tat um, on how you modernize your force. Instead, what's most concerning uh, to me as the senior intel officer um, watching this every day is what are you going to do with it? How is it organized for, for ground order of battle and ground conflict and ground combat? And how is it that they're training with it? So Admiral Studeman alluded to this a little bit earlier. So they've studied our doctrine. Um, they have looked at Russian doctrine. And what they've decided to do is organize 
their ground combat formations into essentially brigade combat teams and fight them as the U.S. does. There's some, there's some goodness in that. One, it's a little bit of validation that perhaps what we've been doing and how we're doing it um, is a good measure across the world. Um, it also should, if we're studying, and in fact, we know our own doctrine, which sometimes you could probably question, you know, how much we study our own, study our own doctrine. Um, it tells us we ought to be able to then reverse engineer and figure out how they're going to fight us uh, on the land. Um, the thing that it doesn't account for, though, uh, and is in some cases the hardest for us to calibrate and assess is where are they in respect to developing competence and then training it to a level of confidence that allows PLA ground force commanders to reduce their tactical and operational risk from high to low. That's what's concerning because that's really hard um, to collect on. Um, you know, when we're watching these things every single day uh, in terms of how they conduct combined arms uh, operations, uh, we look at models like we've developed in the United States Army, our combat training centers, whether it's the National Training Center out of Fort Irwin, California, or our Joint Readiness Training Center in, uh, in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Um, the PLA are fully aware of how it is that we train there, how hard it is, the repetitions that we get, the fact that we use an extremely uncooperative opposing force, and they've modeled theirs like that. Realistic training that in some cases probably surpasses what we do. Well, because there's risk that we take into calculation when it comes to live fires and so forth. But they're doing it. So their glide path to becoming very confident with this modernized capability that, matches, that meets with an increased capacity um, is a concern. So that's what we're focusing on. Um, and again, as for Indo-PACOM, the service that's responsible for monitoring ground order of battle, um, that's, where we're, that's where we're looking at. And I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much. So the challenge of going last, um, <laughs> and being a Marine, of course, because we operate in uh, all the domains, so I, I won't spend a lot of time talking about uh, China, because I think my fellow J2s have talked about that. Um, uh, my name is Andy Moyer, I'm the G2 for Marine Forces Pacific, uh, and also Fleet Marine Forces uh, Pacific, right? Two hats with uh, w one boss in charge. So uh, if you don't wear my uniform, you probably don't have the Commandant's planning guidance uh, on your nightstand. Um, so I want to shape this just a little bit differently uh, in, in my what will be very brief remarks and say, uh, yes, rising China, risen China, et cetera, et cetera. You know, what are we doing about it? So uh, since 2001, uh, the Marine Corps spent a lot of time on the ground in the Central Command AOR. Uh, and then uh, realized uh, through uh, some documents like the National Defense Strategy, National Military Strategy, and all that, China, Russia, reemergent, uh, and all that, uh, kind of had to rethink what we were doing. And so, kind of like going back to your high school reunion after 20 years, uh, we're getting back with the Navy after 20 years. And, and we're looking at each other and going, wow, you've changed a little bit, <laughs> right? And the Navy's looking at us going, yeah, you put on some weight all that time in the ground and uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, and we did. As a service, uh, we, we got heavy, uh, and we, we, out of necessity, uh, equipped ourselves uh, to fight uh, a very specific uh, campaign in Iraq and Afghanistan that does not necessarily marry up very neatly uh, with where we're headed in the future, uh, which is underneath uh, that guy called the Joint Force Maritime Component Commander, right? Um, so we have a lot of work to do. We have some conceptual frameworks for how we're going about that work, right? Things like littoral operations in the contested environment, uh, EABO. Uh, but purpose behind those things, of course, uh, really gets down to naval integration uh, and uh, establishing uh, sea control and sea denial and, and developing capabilities to help the Joint Force Maritime Component Commander uh, do those things. Um, because I want time for questions, I'm going to go ahead and just stop there with uh, by closing saying uh, yes. China is a concern, um, 
one that we all uh, need to take very seriously. Uh, and uh, look forward to your questions. Thanks. Okay, we monopolize the first two-thirds of uh, this segment uh, here. The final one-third is all yours. Uh, so please, uh, you know, fire away, Gridley. Thank you to all the panelists. We have a whole lot of questions that have come in over email, and they'll be up on your screen in front of you. First one, what are your thoughts on how we break the Chinese momentum? Yeah, so I'll start and then invite any other comments uh, here. <clears throat> the first part of... Uh, being able to break the momentum is actually getting the truth out and to have people understand the nature of the challenge. And so <clears throat> what I find is a, a very uneven understanding you know, wherever I go with regard to <clears throat> Chinese ambitions, their capabilities, their tactics, um, the true nature of what we're dealing with. And I would just say that I, I think a great deal of naivete actually prevails um, in many key places, and it's time for us to actually study up on what the Chinese are doing. We have to help with that, and so I think that uh, DOD, uh, the IC, the intel community, we have a job in front of us, and the job will not be done in one year or three years. We'll have to be telling the truth and explaining what's going on to our friends, our partners, our allies, to the domestic U.S. audience. Um, I'm disturbed that uh, in our current environment, we just don't debate China as much. It's the trade war now, and that's kind of what we're isolated on and focused on. And this is so much more, and the national debate needs to occur because we're not facing uh, a competitor. We're, con face we're facing an adversary, right, that has a specific purpose that is on the march, that is doing things with a specific intent that I've described to you. And uh, we need to awaken in more places, um, and we need to be able to then translate that understanding into real actions. And if you're in the U.S. academic environment, you ought to be thinking about whether or not you want to take that money to be able to, instead of just having a, st a steady supply of money now where you don't have to put in your grant submissions, you rethink the idea that um, there's a security vulnerability component of the way that you're sharing your insights with other Chinese academics, many of whom actually are PLA in disguise. Um, the Chinese have a saying, they call it uh, picking honey, in, or sorry, picking flowers in foreign lands to make honey in China. And they are exploiting our open system to be able to learn from us and get leap ahead technologies. How did this rise occur? Well, they were able to do it uh, based on your R&D your intellectual property. Uh, Chinese are very adept at learning all that stuff and then converting it so they are quicker to commercialize and to militarize uh, the technology and understanding. We gotta close the back door. How do you stop the momentum? Have a better sense of our vulnerability and the fact that you know we're being essentially exploited in almost every sector of our society. And so we can get stiffer, we can be harder uh, until such time as we have the confidence and the moxie uh, to take those kinds of steps, you'll find that China's rise will continue to accelerate. Uh, we're fueling it. We're the propellant. And so if you're looking at cybersecurity laws, um, you ought to you question how much regulation needs to be there. That's for a larger national debate. It's not for intelligence people to dictate what the answer is, but I'll tell you that what we see is the hemorrhage every single day, terabytes of data, stuff that we spent a lot of money on to innovate and do research and development. Chinese are just able to skip those steps and to be able to quickly take that uh, data and convert it into what you see. You see a lot of Chinese platforms that look awfully like U.S. and Western platforms, right? And so. I think there are lots of ways we can break the momentum. I think it's a whole of society conversation we need to have. It's not just about how do we confront the military, um, but there's a dime fill sort of aspect to it that it's about time for us to have the conversation and we need to help other countries uh, also have those internal conversations about the steps that they will, they will take uh, to deal with this kind of threat. Anybody else on the panel? Hey, sir, if I could just add a couple of things. I want to strengthen also what uh, Admiral Studeman said in terms of uh, studying. So I think when it comes to this, as, as in many things, if we spend about 80% of our time understanding the problem, and this is a problem, and then 20% of our time 
um, developing, you know, the, or refining a cogent strategy um, to deal with it, then we'll probably be better off. So a lot of study. Um, there's three things that we sort of look at on how it is that you, uh, how you slow the momentum. Uh, one of them is, is that you can test China across multiple domains in what it is that they're doing. Create multiple planning dilemmas for them so that they have to reprioritize and divert resources, which, you know, what the goal would be is that we perhaps slow their momentum. So I think those are three sort of quick hitters on how it is that you slow them. You all know that we're saturated with information these days, and to try to figure out how you get truth out there is challenging. The four strengths that China has is that its author their messaging is authoritative, it's repetitive, it's consistent, and it's redundant. And when you see a bad news story on China, it doesn't, it's not around very long. We, we've got to be better at illuminating those missteps, those heavy-handed tactics, and, and get the word out, as Admiral Studeman said. Okay, next uh, question, please. At what point do you think China will tell the Russians, thanks, but we'll take it from here, so long? Uh, yeah, we have a slide on China, Russia. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe time to throw that one up there. But I, I would tell you that uh, the Chinese and Russians have looked at us, and they know, we've talked about it, we fear the China-Russia condominium. And uh, they said, well, we know what the, what the Americans fear, and they've rushed right in there. Uh, there are lots of pre-existing relationships that China and Russia have had and the intelligence services in terms of defense uh, equipment, uh, economic relationships, et cetera. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the Chinese and Russians are purposely doing more to demonstrate that if we continue on course with our behavior, uh, that they will continue and to go together. I think Russia, in their quiet conversation, worries, worries about being a pawn of the Chinese. And if you can take a look at the bottom there, I'll tell you, it, it's, it's helpful if you wanted to really decompose this into its individual parts. You'll see the areas for alignment, and they're certainly there, right? They want to break the U.S. alliance system, create a multiple world, <clears throat> normalize authoritarianism, uh, those kinds of things. But the points of friction are also there. And so for, it's up for us, I think, up to us to be able to identify what they are and to take a look and go, there are lots of areas where their interests don't align. Um, and so Central Asia, the Arctic, military sales, uh, where the Chinese ultimately will sponge everything that, that the Russians would be willing to share, but then make stuff better uh, in the future and essentially outfox them in the markets uh, for global arms sales. Uh, and then, of course, uh, demographics in, uh, in Russia and the, and the Union dimensionality of the uh, Russian economy uh, with the dependency on oil and natural gas. And so these are areas where, um, for now, it looks like this is a, uh, a very uh, challenging uh, relationship uh, where China and Russia are working together. They are not interoperable. They are not fully integrated, but they want to try to demonstrate that they are that. But I think um, that ultimately um, that Putin's going to have to come to terms with the idea that it will be the junior partner in that relationship and that uh, they're going to have to think about the long-term consequences of essentially uh, giving China even greater strengths uh, that the Chinese ultimately will use against the Russians. So I think it's a good question. Um, and I think we ought to take a look at the, the long uh, term as well as the short term and how that relationship will develop. Other thoughts? Yeah, I'll just uh, echo Admiral Studeman and that it's really going to be when does Russia perceive that, you know, they're not gaining from this relationship. So as long as it's beneficial to Russia, I think they're kind of the key part because we already, you know, perceive that China is the senior partner. Neither Russia nor China, you know, they, they want that multipolar world. Well, Russia does. China probably wants a unipolar world. And I think Russia understands that they'll never get back, you know, anywhere where they were. So it's really kind of trying to find, again, as the Admiral mentioned, those, you know, where's that, that break point and can we kind of accelerate that or find ways to kind of, you know, not allow that to come closer together. Okay. Next one. Thank you. Next one. How does North Korea fit into the conversation about China if it does at all? Uh, well, I could approach this in a lot of different angles. Uh, I'd start with uh, if you look at uh, the way we did planning, you know, 10 years ago, uh, we would say, okay, let's look at contingency operations, 
North Korea, well, we have to have a plan for North Korea. China, well, what ifs, and you have a plan. These days, you have to think about multiple opponents in the same, uh, same kind of scenario, right? And so if there is a dust up in North Korea, however you want to describe it, you get into it, uh, we have to count uh, on the Chinese uh, coming in. We call that third party intervention. And the likelihood of third party intervention on any kind of major peninsula uh, contingency is high. And so we will not have the luxury of actually dealing with a single opponent in many of our biggest challenges uh, there. The same may be true if there's uh, something that relates to Taiwan or Senkakus or South China Sea. We know that the relationship uh, is uh, so chummy with uh, North Korea and Russia in this respect that they probably would be um, willing to agitate and do lots of other things that would create dilemmas for us in a crisis, uh, force us to use ISR assets or other capabilities to sort of track and monitor what they may be doing to make life harder uh, for us, uh, depending on what the actual contingency is. And so that's our, that's our strategic concern about uh, how we see these relationships uh, developing. Um, we could go into where North Korea will head here in the future and, uh, and the removal of the self-imposed moratorium that we're likely to see here uh, at the end of next month. Uh, we would hope that China is a restraining force uh, on North Korea. Um, and to a certain extent, over time, they have been. But a lot of people overplay the degree of Chinese influence on uh, uh, Kim Jong-un and have with uh, his father and his father before him. And so, uh, so North Korea, uh, in many ways, is uh, going to make independent choices, factoring some of the Chinese efforts uh, but but uh, that, is, that is not a guaranteed thing that China can keep a cap on some of the excesses uh, that uh, Pyongyang may decide to, uh, uh, to uh, pursue uh, here as we look at their nuclear force and what they want to do to have sanctions eased, uh, et cetera. So this is a complicated one with many facets. Uh, I hit on a couple of them, but not all of them, and I'd invite anybody else to weigh in. So I'll jump on one uh, at the operational level of war, uh, but that has strategic implications, and, and it's a little bit more truth-telling about China's role in the world. So with a seat on the UN Security Council, part of your job is to be a good steward of international norms. And so we have UN Security Council resolutions that are aimed at the, the denuclearization of North Korea and the non-proliferation. And it's difficult as a maritime operator um, to try to enforce those sanctions by direction of, of the SECDEF and the National Security Council and the President, um, to watch uh, Chinese entities and Chinese networks support um, the uh, flagrant uh, violation of those UN Security Council resolutions. And so we are devoting our time, effort, and energy. Uh, and for someone who came from a network-busting world, uh, like Trent's job, um, it's extremely frustrating to be mapping the network and know that you have the ability to crush it, but you're part of a UN Security Council resolution team that's not playing, that is, um, that is not a willing partner, and in fact, doing things to subvert um, and undermine the very uh, activity that as a world body, we are, trying to, uh, we are trying to limit and we are trying to influence. So um, that goes on every day at our in our seventh fleet, our engagement coordination cell with a host of partners, <laughs> Uh, that are doing uh, really um, great work in the maritime domain. Um, but when we get to the UN Security Council, uh, we're met with a political frustration again. So for someone who's, who's crushed networks uh, when I wasn't looking at China, uh, that's super frustrating. And I know that um, our, our team out there is, 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 is killing it, and we've got the network mapped. Um, but that North Korea-China interaction is, is a pretty, pretty frustrating point uh, when you get to the uh, operational level of war. And it's just another example of say do gaps and uh, irresponsible powers. And so, uh, so thus, the, the strategic implication is that uh, North Korea hasn't felt a pinch uh, from sanctions enforcement, and therefore, it doesn't influence their calculus. And so, that's the consequence of not having the cooperation of countries like China in the enforcement regime. Okay, next one. Does the joint force need to accept greater risk in training and conduct more realistic training scenarios to match China 
possibly to include EW and cyber effects? Yeah, so uh, we need to do more live virtual constructive. We need to be able to fire off more ammo. Uh, we need to have ranges so we can fully test our advanced systems. Um, and uh, we need to do so with our allies in a way that makes sense. And so there's, a, there's an information sharing and there's sort of a, there's a foreign disclosure uh, level of risk that I think needs to be um, raised uh, so that we can do more. Um, and I would say that, you know, if you're an industry partner in here and you're looking for ways to truly make a difference, uh, the modeling and simulation of cyber and EW space is one of those areas where it's foggy. With the, with the complex set of hardware that we're seeing in the Chinese inventory and ours and our allies, being able to understand all the permutations of the interactions there, that's really tough. Uh, but you want to be able to know them for both planning purposes and programmatic purposes. And uh, we have limited capabilities in these areas, but that's, I think, one of the areas where uh, it would yield uh, for us some of the greatest insights and, in fact, how we should optimize our investment strategies and how we see sort of the correlation of forces matching up on what we may, may need to do, uh, not just with the technology, but with the tactics and the techniques, uh, et cetera. And so that's, a, I think, a real area uh, where we need to uh, bring our capabilities up to snuff um, and uh, ensure that we can make the best possible decisions on our end, knowing that we have limited resources. So this was my last job, so yes and yes, and I'll, I'll highlight mostly on the second part about the realistic training scenarios to match China. So it's across the entire counter ISRT spectrum. It's not just cyber and EW, but the whole of the counter ISRT needs to be ingrained and integrated into our, our joint training as we go up through the workup cycles and get ready to deploy however our various formations deploy. Um, this has been, uh, in, this will be enabled, as Admiral Suman mentioned, by live virtual and constructive uh, technologies to help um, us do better at that integrated training because what's really challenging, and this is the most challenging thing, is doing these, doing this type of training in an open environment for your, for your adversary to collect on it is tough. So we've got to be, we got to figure out through technology how to best get after that second portion of that um, so we're not giving away the farm. I think maybe a way to look at it is, uh, is one, you just build your joint force training apparatus to the maximum capability and capacity that you think you need, and then work backwards with what your risk mitigation measures are, whether it's uh, work harder at helping uh, influence policy, um, working through foreign disclosure, um, you know, how we share information with partners, but build to, build to optimal, and then you can build in the risk mitigation measures. Just one last thought on that. So there, there's a modernization component that goes along with that, uh, as well as a you know logistics maintenance thing, right? It, it's hard to do realistic training if you can't even get airplanes off the ground. Okay. How would you assess the level of national commitment by our key Pacific allies in countering China's rise? Uh, that's a really great question because um, you know, China is sort of here to stay, right? And so countries that live closer to China have to, you know, make uh, tough choices. And they don't want to be confronted with a choice of, A, it's America or China. And so, uh, so and it's not a simple, yeah, I'll <clears throat> depend on China for my trade and economy, and I'll depend on the U.S. for my security. It's uh, much more complex. And so oversimplifying this is actually not helpful. And so the reality is there are lots of reasons why trade should be, in fact, supported. And, you know, ideally it's done with transparent ways, rules of law, uh, things that allow for us to, you know, uh, continue to advance the prosperity of our peoples. Um, and so we need to be doing the conditioning that pushes China into those kinds of behaviors uh, while all this is ongoing. This is really tough depending on where you are. You are... Um, in a different kind of position to push back. So Vietnam, for example, will push back more forthrightly than many other Southeast Asian nations uh, regarding China's behavior, the intimidation and the bullying in the South China Sea. You know, they faced uh, here in the last few months <clears throat> H-6 flights and Chinese combatants and Coast Guard and maritime militia that were swarming all over their oil survey uh, operations in the southern South China Sea in a place called Vanguard Bank. At H6 is coming down almost every uh, other day. 
uh, you know, showing that they could potentially deliver ordnance and getting practice doing long-range flights. That's the nature of the dynamic uh, there between Vietnam and China, and Vietnam's not having any of it. Uh, and so you do find that they are very vocal about pushing back. At the same time, they have to be pretty careful because the Vietnamese have learned that if they highlight too much of what's going on, the Vietnamese population, uh, very nationalistic, uh, tends to sort of get worked up about it. And so there have been riots in, the, in uh, Vietnam that have actually threatened Chinese businesses, and that has gotten out of control in the past. And so for different reasons, there's balancing in how you deal uh, with China. If you're looking at uh, Singapore, one of our you know, best friends that allows us access, uh, they're trying to do a, he a heck of a dance uh, there uh, to be able to balance um, you know, relationships uh, there that they know um, aren't going to be solved by just picking you know, one friend and ignoring the other. And so uh, it's on a, it depends on which country you're talking about, but there's a gradient um, of pushback. Some of it's done uh, in very sophisticated ways. <clears throat> and I won't name the country, but I'll tell you one country that says a lot of yesing and nodding to the Chinese, but at the end of the day, they are very astute about limiting the extent of economic penetration, about how much debt or the loans that they'll take. Uh, having multiple partners within any kind of single deal, all the, all the while hosting the Chinese, uh, doing a lot of uh, nodding, and making sure that the relationship uh, you know, stays on an even keel. And so uh, that sort of thing's happening all the time. We have to be very, I think, sophisticated on our, our side uh, to make sure that we don't uh, uh, become over-torqued about uh, the, the Chinese and the other nations' relationships in a way that actually ends up being counterproductive. I'll just make a, uh, a prediction that based on what the J2 mentioned about North Korea, um, nothing brings partners together uh, like a little bit more drama. We saw in 2017 um, the, uh, the coalescing of, of Japan and South Korea uh, and our Five Eyes partners in a way we hadn't in this theater in a while, and it almost felt like a, a mini NATO. Um, we worked, and actually it was Admiral Harris when he was PACOM commander, um, to normalize um, sharing. Uh, Earlier on in our, my time in this theater, everything was bilateral. Oh, if you came from Europe, which I actually did my first tour, uh, you don't understand, this is a bilateral theater. Um, we have to work, and this is one of the challenges, um, I attend meetings where I attend meetings with the foreign disclosure officer, and then I go to the international engagement people. I'm like, why don't you two sit together? Um, because a lot of times, and with senior officers in the room, I'm going to risk some, you know, they'll go to a, a DV event, and they'll say, oh, we can do that, and we can do, the, do that. And then the FDO knocks on the door and says, sir, you can't do any of that. Um, so bringing those partners together, and again, sometimes it's a little red force action that, that forces, um, you know, Chinese character for uh, crisis is danger and opportunity. So I saw that in 2017. Uh, I was moving from a British partner to a Japanese partner to a, a Korean partner with all the same information. Um, so one of the things we can do is write for release and, and we can make sure we're driving the FDOs and international engagement people together to be in lockstep, um, to share what we can and to be clear about um, how the operational uh, folks can get their counterparts uh, working for foreign disclosure, not just uh, you know military intelligence information, but also the operational information that that our coalitions and partners uh, need based on necessity and, and activity. Can I just add, I, I think uh, the allies uh, in the theater, depends on which ones you're talking about, on the Five Eyes side, uh, they're very uh, aware of the Chinese objectives and they have been very courageous in how they employ, you know, many of their instruments of national power. And so, you know, the Japanese are key, the South Koreans, you know, how they, uh, how they uh, array their forces, what they do, what they say with the Chinese to condition them in a good way. Um, the amount of support we have for freedom of navigation in the commons, whether it's the air or the maritime domain, you find Australian, Japanese, you know, uh, other forces that are uh, prepared to sort of do the same kinds of things that we've done for decades and decades uh, with regard to being there and demonstrating that we have the right uh, to be able to operate in, in the international commons. And so uh, that's, that's just going to have to be, I think, the steady spade work
that we'll have to do together uh, over time to show that, in fact, there are rules that we're going to stand by uh, as, uh, as allies and partners because they're important uh, for stability and prosperity. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. This one's a two-parter. <laughs> Given the extortionate terms that China levied on its poorest infrastructure development partners, e.g. Belt and Road, what are the ramifications of a cluster of defaults by the poorest nations on the security environment across Asia? And then the second part, when and how will China and India collide and uh, how will it play out? Okay, we got, we're going to extend this uh, session by two hours in order to cover you know, what has just been asked. Uh, let me take China and India first. Uh, they've already collided. And look at historically in the border areas on India's northeast border, uh, Chinese have massively built up in their border areas. Uh, and so there are clashes there. They tend to be, I guess, a local skirmish every now and again, a small flashpoint that doesn't you know, trip into something uh, bigger. But the Indians are really concerned about uh, what the rise of China means for them, and they'd like to orient their policies uh, so that uh, they're less obsessed with what's happening to the West uh, and so they can deal with you know, what's happening with China and their influence uh, across the Indo-Pacific. Um, they have the Act East uh, policy uh, there. And so uh, what we find is that because of China's behavior, we have new openings uh, with India. India will remain non-aligned. Their independence is uh, something that they uh, historically uh, will, you know, fight for uh, to the last man, and, and I agree that's a, that's a great position. Uh, but our interests do align in certain key areas. I just got back from India a week ago, and so uh, we're talking about uh, information sharing, and uh, we have uh, new uh, levels of coordination on things uh, that to get after our shared interests. And so I'd say philosophically, there's already been a collision between the way India would like to defend the rules-based international order and China, which would like to change them. And, uh, and so that will be a struggle, just like we have one, but I, I think we can count on the Indians to do their part uh, going forward. Uh, and they are an example of how a large nation with many people, in fact, could be democratic and how that can work uh, for them. Uh, so um, so that, that's where we are. And so we'll see how that, uh, that goes. But you can be sure that when the Chinese uh, expand their military operations in the Indian Ocean, uh, that, uh, that the Indians will be very concerned and they'll be on it in every respect. Okay, so the first one, the ramifications of defaults. Um, I, I just say that uh, we've seen it. We've seen that already play out. And uh, Sri Lanka is probably the most well-known example of how that converted into Chinese ownership of their port um, and how that has allowed them to have essentially a base from which they can uh, extend uh, their reach uh, into the Indian Ocean. And uh, those, those, uh, those loan restructuring uh, discussions are really hard. And where the Chinese go is they're able to exact uh, all sorts of different um, uh, benefits uh, from it, uh, from these host nations. Uh, those who, at the end of the day, have regretted that they uh, borrowed too much, took the loans, uh, didn't understand how the terms in the back end uh, became impossible for them to meet. And so you'd hate to see other nations once again sort of fall into this lesson, which has been learned abroad. And I think it's our job to help highlight those cases and to do things that help nations on the front end to be able to make smart choices. The State Department is really focused well on this. Uh, they have uh, offered to uh, facilitate getting contract lawyers to be able to help nations review you know, the contract that the Chinese want to rush through, that if you don't sign by Saturday, then the deal's off. You know, so, they, so these host nations get bum-rushed, right, to do something that they don't even fully understand what they're signing. The State Department's saying, hey, listen, there's a smart way you can approach this, where you, you know, instead of, you know, just having your one lawyer to the Chinese 20 lawyers, you know, have a few people there, slow it down, take a look at the fine print, look out for this, because this language really means the following. And uh, small nations that don't have those kind of resources will m be more vulnerable, right, to those tactics. And that's where we can really, you know, help a friend 
out as we think about different measures to avoid, you know, what we're seeing uh, here, what we've already seen. Jens? So I'll just briefly add on the, um, the small nations part. Um, you look at World War II in Europe, and, and Churchill talked about the soft underbelly. So I look at those small nations uh, in the South Pacific uh, where there is a Navy presence. You don't see it, uh, but that's my job. And um, at the end of the day, um, you know, those, those changes in diplomatic relations are frustrating and some of the other uh, financial things, but it's, to me, in those areas, all about infrastructure. Um, you know, the Commandant's guidance, we don't like to talk about island hopping, but, but geography matters in the war plan. And so um, you might be able to be recognized uh, by the PRC, but if I can get access to that port for those Marines, or I can put a FARP in the middle of nowhere, um, because there was a default issue or a predatory lending, if you will, um, that soft underbelly uh, is, is going to be uh, prime real estate um, in, in a potential conflict to come. Yeah, I would say just adding on that, again, it's, it really is about kind of uh, finding a way to, you know, reinforce them using all the instruments of power. And, uh, you know, we have one piece from a military perspective, but I think uh, definitely looking at it as a, you know, a whole nation and making sure that we're partnering well, we're doing our part as military professionals. Uh, because again, that terrain doesn't change. And same thing from an, you know, an Air Force perspective. It's, it's the same terrain that's been strategic uh, whenever there's been conflict in the Pacific. So uh, those are things I think we really need to keep our eye on and stay aware of. And Admiral Studeman's talked a lot about you know, economic intelligence being one of the focus areas uh, for the IC uh, so we can partner better with State Department and then you know, make sure that we're informing our seniors where there's vulnerabilities or things along those lines on the economic realm. And that, that's especially uh, relevant to some of these these uh, smaller nations in the Indo-Pacific AOR. Okay, so uh, we have five minutes. Let me just do a quick kind of wrap up here. Uh, I hope, hopefully, uh, you don't view what we presented to you. I was telling Admiral Branch earlier, uh, it can sound alarmist, this stuff, but the fact of the matter is that the actual facts are alarming, right? It's not the messenger that's accentuating the challenge. It, in fact, is uh, of such a wide and deep scope uh, that it deserves our best efforts here and we need to get our minds right to be able to deal with it first and then we need to act in lots of different ways and it needs to be not just our whole society but all others in the international community. Uh, Indopaycom has a certain role within the DOD segment uh, here on the M in DIME. Uh, the Admiral talks about strategy of regaining the advantage in all respects um, and so we, we push hard for uh, uh, increased uh, joint force lethality. That's a major issue. You find that in our national defense strategy, and it's at the top of the list uh, to be able to make sure that we can compete successfully and still carry out our missions, uh, even in the environment uh, that's being presented in terms of red capability. Uh, posture and presence matters, right? We have tough uh, discussions about global force management, right? Iran distracts us, and we, we have capability that needs to go uh, to respond to, you know, hot areas. At the same time, there's a commitment here uh, to improve our posture and presence in this theater. Because what we've learned over time is that when we are here with our allies, with our partners, that that has an assurance effect and has a deterrence effect. That's what you want. You want to avoid major power war. The main effort in this is winning without fighting. In other words, recognizing the struggle you're in and being able to use all of your instruments in a way that prevents a human tragedy from developing and conditioning those nations that uh, are threatening the world order to understand that in fact they can't find a place in it under certain kinds of rules and norms that in fact uh, they, they can benefit from. And then the alliances and the partnership. If you take a look at our strategy, this is probably one of the most critical things is to be, to be sure that we are arm in arm and linked up with uh, the rest of the nations of the world who also have an interest in seeing the outcome of this struggle be one uh, that leads us to a better place. So we have, we have a challenger. Uh, we aren't necessarily, you know, uh, destined for a Thucydides trap uh, kind of situation, but it's going to take fine-tuned management of these problems over time. And so that's what's required of our nation today. DOD will do its part. 
I trust our national leaders will also uh, find policies that will enable them to address it, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but uh, hopefully this was helpful to you as you do your part as well in, in meeting this challenge. Thanks.